I'm short. I hope you can see me. Uh, you can definitely hear me, I hope. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. So I will start uh, talking about the need for AI-driven networks, starting from the digital transformation that is ongoing and rapid and huge, uh, because it sets the context and the relevance for um, AI-driven networks. So the digital transformation is without doubt a uh, huge technology disruptive advancement for the human way of life and uh, the society. And it encompasses uh, technically a lot of advancements where we see in the society um, autonomous and automated infrastructure functions and uh, that are vital to the society like automated transportation and intelligent transportation systems. We see economically that it changes our consumer patterns and how we uh, grow new businesses and even work. And we see that it changes the way we intellectually attain information and make uh, our understanding about the world, how we socialize, how we educate ourselves, and so on. And ultimately, it also impacts on legislation, making new uh, regulatory uh, updates uh, to protect the digitalized citizen. Um, what I find most exciting though with this development is that digitalization empowers the individual in a completely new way, regardless of background, regardless of physical abilities and so on or gender. So there will be a huge game changer ahead. Now this change of course, is uh, related to a massive amount of data generation. And this is the case simply because, well, one issue or one contributing factor to that is that gadgets get cheaper, so more people can afford to buy them. So in a not too distant future, most uh, of the global population will be connected by at least one gadget or even more. And that creates a lot of data and data transactions. Uh, Additionally to that, we have uh, developments in the connected industries, new businesses and new services um, in the, both the private and public sphere that rely on connectivity and the internet of things and sensors and decision making in the cloud and so on. And all that together will not only create a massive amount of data, I mean, that's obvious, but it will create a massive amount of data transactions at an unprecedented scale and intensity that the next generation networks need to be able to handle. Because if we don't do it, we will not have the underlying infrastructures that uh, are required to support complex and large AI-driven uh, tasks or services. So this is a real challenge because of course we are aware of and we understand the concepts of big data. How do we handle massive data sets when they are at a certain place and how do we distribute them from a computational and storage perspective? But there is another aspect that is equally important to make large complex AI applications and computations to scale properly. And that is also speed and the ability for, for the network to actually deliver data transactions with a certain networking performance that could be critical for certain AI applications where the round trip time need to be very short, where you need to be able to um, transmit intermediary results, uh, for example, within a certain time frame. So this becomes even more complicated in heterogeneous networks. Uh, so, Given the development here that everything is getting digitalized, we're putting more and more critical um, AI-driven apps potentially in the cloud and uh, for, that relies on connectivity. We also will have much stronger rec technical requirements uh, when it comes to networks being secure, fast, resilient, and available all the time. We already have those expectations now it works so-so. It can be challenging to connect to a telco uh, quite often. And these requirements will become stronger and stronger. 
And this is specifically important, like I said, for um, when we are starting to have critical applications that could be critical to societal services uh, in the future. So how do we deal with this scale and how do we make, uh, how do we ensure that the technical requirements are fulfilled to fit that massive scale that we're facing? Well, we could always add much more of everything. That's the easy way of doing it. More bandwidth, more uh, cables, more fiber, more servers, and so on and so on. But it's costly and is not very sustainable. And that what I, is what I would say is another requirement that future networks needs to be sustainable. Because the digital transformation is also driving the buildup of new data centers. They pop up uh, all the time and they're getting bigger and bigger. And that also means that they are uh, consuming a lot of energy. And I read somewhere that within five to 10 years, data centers will basically consume like one fifth of uh, the total energy production uh, in the world annually. And considering that digital services then also creates a carbon footprint. We have all reasons to also look into how we can build networks effectively at, um, and operating resource efficiently. Uh, I would say that this is also quite important for future service providers um, because consumers are getting pickier where, where and from their products. Uh, are produced. It's the same thing with the food that we uh, eat. We check if it's organic. It's the same thing when we look at uh, where the home electricity uh, were produced, if it comes from clean sources. And I would expect that we will basically reason the same when we pick the next internet service provider or buy uh, other types of services. So this is important for the industry to, to, to look at. So the question is, how come there is such an overconsumption of energy in the first place and how, how can we deal with it so that it meets uh, the sustainability requirements? Well, um, the re main reason is, or one reason is, that uh, network operation is to a large extent based on over-provisioning, systematic over-provisioning. And this is the case and this is done because uh, this is the way to ensure customer satisfaction. Right? So it's nothing strange that it's done, and until now it's probably been doable, but it's not a sustainable solution. Um, what this leads to is that there is a huge energy waste caused by running data centers that annually would be enough to power up mid-sized countries. Right? That's huge waste, and it corresponds to billions of dollars every year. And the reason is that what over-provisioning actually means is that it's not uncommon that uh, servers are heavily underutilized in a data center, for example. Uh, it's not uncommon that servers are only utilized 20% of their total capacity, and at the same time, they are still up and running 24-7. So this is something that we need to change. So the over-provisioning is implemented by scripts that are designed in line with common practice today. And that in combination with quite blunt and crude monitoring tools effectively prevents us from making effective resource provisioning. And it also prevents us from squeezing out, uh, out every drop of the resources of the infrastructure that we already have. If we could make better resource provisioning decisions that are more precise, to the actual need, and if we could make better predictions about the network behavior and performance, then we could squeeze out much more uh, of the existing resources, and then we wouldn't need to buy new stuff all the time. All right, so speaking of, um, speaking of uh, monitoring tools, so the monitoring tools that are available today are also quite crude because they are designed mainly to provide some analysis of aggregated measurements, like five minute averages. And they don't reflect much then that that network is up and running 
is not that much more. And this is an issue because what we really would need to have is uh, more uh, sophisticated monitoring approaches that are relatively, at, that are at the same time lightweight so that we can preserve much more information that we can use to make more exact decisions. And it also has to be done in a scalable way. We can always copy traffic or measure all the time, but that doesn't scale. So scale and information uh, preservation is actually very important. So to change these two, this development uh, into something that can be sustainable, we need to do two things. We need to make uh, monitoring and analysis much more efficient and information preserving so that we can make better decisions. And we need to uh, design adaptive resource allocation schemes and provisioning approaches that are adaptive and fast. And most likely, those two things will also be heavily supported by learning. Uh, so once we have that, we, then we have the foundation for uh, the AI foundation for creating uh, AI-driven networks in the future that are technically um, me meeting the technical requirements of availability, resilience, uh, that they are fast and secure, sustainable, and also fit uh, for digital services at scale. Okay. So um, it has been mentioned here that uh, networks are uh, operated by scripts in basically a semi-automated way. And so far it has been possible to do so fairly effectively. Uh, the networks are indeed working, but with, with consideration to the scale that we are facing, uh, semi-automated um, scripting and operation of networks is indeed an overwhelming task. And this becomes even more overwhelming because it's not only the physical infrastructure we need to manage, there are also a lot of different uh, combinations when we start adding programmability to the networks as well. So this needs to be fully automated. Uh, and done in uh, an intelligent way. I, and I think that this pretty much makes AI then relevant for all parts of network operations and service management, exactly as this image illustrates. And it covers all uh, anticipated AI applications uh, from the right all the way down to the left that are supposed to uh, support it. So ultimately, uh, I think that this figure illustrates the duality between being able to have complex AI applications up and running at scale uh, and have, depending on uh, an AI-driven network beneath. Because if we don't have AI-driven networks, we will not be able to have complex AI apps running at scale and thereby we will not uh, have the full advancement uh, of the dig digitalization either. So everything is connected. So in my view, uh, our job as researchers and engineers is to first and foremost design, um, gain insight about practically applicable design patterns for making networks operate in a fully autonomous manner together with uh, intelligent uh, data-driven systems. And uh, with the aim of solving very complex uh, resource management and resource management tasks and network operation tasks autonomously. Um, I can say straight away that it's not going to be one huge neural network that will solve all the problems. It will not be two neural networks that will solve the problems, but it will be a chain of different methods collaborating together. And it's exactly this chain, what are good pra practices that we need to help out with designing. So it will be a combination of rule-based systems, uh, combinatorial optimization where it fits along with uh, data-driven methods. So it's indeed a chain, but it can be developed in different ways. Okay, so another thing to make uh, AI-driven networks work and fulfill its purpose is also effective um, pipelining of information throughout the network. And this can look differently depending on what uh, the actual in infrastructure actually is. And essentially, 
uh, it's uh, vital for AI-driven mechanisms, me mechanisms and processes in the distributed systems that information can flow and be delivered in a timely fashion at the right place, because this is how we offload centralized processes and can make fast decisions and also enable increased granularity and precision in our decisions. But it requires underlying mechanisms in addition to different machine learning algorithms that we may employ. So uh, essentially, um, when it comes to monitoring and analysis, uh, what we need to do is to design mechanisms that are resource adequate for the underlying infrastructure at hand. It can be wireless, it can be wired. It has to operate close to the data sources, close to the users, and it has to be energy efficient, of course, and computationally efficient. And at the same time, we need to uh, develop mechanisms that uh, effectively take care of the resources at the fog, in the fog and in the cloud and in the edge resources. Uh, the combination of edge and cloud effectively uh, paves the way for federated learning in different ways. So this is uh, a very good opportunity to move from centralized uh, processing and machine learning to making it distributed and actually uh, working for networks. Scalability and resiliency is key. So if I would look into what would be uh, prioritized interesting areas to look into, we need to look into how we can effectively store data and convey data without sending all measurements at once. Lightweight computational methods for estimating distributions, designing counters, and so on is extremely imp important, and they have to be uh, uh, designed in such a way that batteries are not drained or doesn't require too much uh, compute resources. Uh, it's a matter of designing basically the features that effectively can uh, represent the network state and the uh, performance behavior locally in the network and then ship that uh, in a package form that doesn't overload uh, the links basically with that kind of traffic. That's one way of seeing it. It's not as straightforward uh, as it seems. It can vary very differently from uh, different radio access network technologies and other access technologies, for example. So it's uh, technology dependent. Then since we have fog and we have cloud and we can uh, exploit that to distribute uh, complex computations for resource allocations and also handle uh, local models for performance uh, analysis and so on. Then what I think is very important is uh, the up information consistency and updates of distributed data sources and replicas and building the mechanisms that accurately can predict over which link and to which place an intermediary result should be shipped. This is important for very uh, critical applications that are depending on performance, like automated cars, for example. And ultimately, what we need to look into is also how we can do these computations fast with lower computational complexity no matter where we are, but specifically uh, in uh, large uh, data centers where we do have larger resources, we're not restrictive. The focus is still on making computations really fast because one key thing to network operation is to be able to scale fast and to act fast uh, in accordance with dynamic changes in the network. Uh, conditions and to provide network operation that is seamless uh, to the user. So whenever there is a change that calls for an update of a control policy, calculating that control policy in line with what is actually ha happening in the network to um, change flows and so on is actually very important. It's important that we can do that fast. So now you know what we need to do. So machine learning for networks uh, is not really that new. It has been studied for decades. Uh, we've seen some good examples here and it has been um, experimented with for all aspects of uh, network management and network operation. And there is basically 
no machine learning approach that hasn't been uh, applied for uh, different uh, network management uh, operations, including convolutional neural networks. So the main shortcoming here is that these methods for a large part don't scale. They are applied in a centralized way for offline analysis. In many cases, such methods are uh, extended with added features for online learning, but it still doesn't help because the main issue is that they don't scale and they are too slow. So what we need to do is to ensure that uh, since we are at it, we need to um, look into how we can design machine learning approaches that are fit for highly distributed systems with the necessary support functions to enable federated learning, not only how we exchange, not only the processes of how we exchange information in the distributed system, but also coupled together with the actual underlying performance and network state. And that requires additional uh, methods and processes. <clears throat> Another thing that I would look into is automated reasoning, because once we have, for example, resource allocation plans that equally well fulfill an objective, then we probably want to analyze which one of them are the best one to apply, for example. And this is necessary because if we just take one of, of, of uh, these plans, the effects could be uh, completely unanticipated and in the worst case also lead to disruptions in the service. So we also need some additional reasoning mechanisms that basically makes a sanity check which solutions we should use. The same goes for distinguishing between anomalies and intrusion um, patterns that look very similar. Then we need something that can reason about what is the most likely uh, cause of that behavior. One thing that I also think is extremely uh, interesting is now security for AI models. This is in general very important for any application. Uh, network ap operation is also basically an AI application. So how do we protect the learned infrastructures from being tampered with? One can imagine that injecting traffic streams with nonsense, nonsense uh, traffic could uh, effectively change uh, resource uh, provisioning decisions and so on with uh, very bad results on top of it. It's also a matter of trust. So. Providers of internet services need also to exhibit that uh, they can protect their AI models. All right, finally, one more thing that I think is extremely important and that is essential for rapidly advancing uh, the development of uh, AI methods for networking is data. And it's not so that uh, we are missing open data sets. There are repositories with data traces. But what we need is a continuous access of data that is up to date and actually reflects the ongoing technological development. And for this reason, I'm driving a uh, project, an initiative together with colleagues for building an, uh, in, an open platform for open AI innovation and research for the telecom domain. And of course, it's possible to um, it will be possible to analyze data that is stored and online streaming. But the main purpose of this project is actually to lower the thresholds for industries to share curated that data at their own premises. And this is important because industries uh, cannot really share data or give away data for obvious reasons. It's uh, privacy preser preserving reasons and proprietary reasons, but by sharing data at their own premises that is curated together with legal processes that can amend the rights for using this data, we see that we can at least open up for some synergetic opportunities and connect the industry with good data scientists that actually also have uh, domain knowledge. So there are a lot of, um, of uh, benefits in this. This just started, so the platform is still in its planning phase. I'm setting the details of the architecture together with my colleagues. Uh, later this spring, we will have a first deployment. So if this sounds interesting, please get in touch me with me because I'm actively looking for project pilots that can help out and contribute with uh, development of tools and also uh, share data. 
So the best way of getting in touch with me is to take a snapshot uh, of this slide. Uh, it contains all the different ways of getting in touch with me, so now you can't say that you didn't know. Um, so if you want to contact me for the CK, you're very welcome. Keep an eye on, out on ck.org. Um, if you want to contact me for other reasons, like research collaboration, you're very welcome. And also, if you want to work in my projects, you're also very welcome because I hire a lot. So with that, thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Steiner. So you see there are plenty of opportunities. Also to ask questions right now. Do you have any question? If not, I have one uh, specifically about the uh, energy consumption angle. Um, it's an important problem. Over-provisioning is uh, the likely cause. But I'm thinking, where does the biggest potential for savings come from at the hardware level? Is it the CPUs that consume more, the AC? Uh, where is it where the most gains can be, uh, can, can be made? Uh, well, um, what I'm saying is that we need to uh, look into methods that can adaptively change the uh, power consumption level of um, of servers and ultimately what that means is to deploy and redeploy and move uh, application processes to servers that can that are fit for running specific processes and basically trying to fit uh, at the best you know laying the puzzle of putting together uh, co-located applications VMs and processes on the same servers and make that deployment much smarter than we do today. And that is a huge combinatorial optimization problem. And the question is, can we, um, can we do it in a more clever way by predicting how workload should be distributed and how traffic should be balanced such that we can only have the most relevant equipment up and running and then just turn off the rest? Thank you. So I have a question. I can wait. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, great presentation. Uh, my question is: Do you think that this fully automation would arise also more security problems? Like uh, it will make uh, ML models more uh, a point of attack? Indeed, uh, and that's why I point specifically to uh, looking into security for AI models, so that we can protect. The, learning structure, the learned structures from being tampered with. So uh, AI, security for AI is um, an emerging uh, research area, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, uh, a question about uh, the open source platform or project. So are you aware also of the open source project ACUMOS? 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 No, but maybe I should. Yeah, I, I uh, sense an opportunity to collaborate. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think because I, I've seen also there is Ericsson in the partners that you mm -hmm. call. And in, in Acumos, there is Orange, Nokia, Acumos, ATT. It's a framework about how to onboard machine learning to ease onboarding. But also they, uh, they try to put in place a um, uh, kind of framework to enable uh, working, I mean, in platform, uh, um, host in the cloud to ease the work, but also they're trying to share data from different uh, types in order to have, let's say, development of tools and put this in, in open space area. So I think, yeah, there should be some connection with the SCK. Uh, definitely. And what I want to point out is, is that this uh, initiative uh, goes within um, another initiative to build national uh, data lab frameworks. So that's why we have sort of our own. But it's not limited to uh, Swedish collaboration, not at all. On the contrary, I'm looking for how to extend this into uh, open innovation um, initiatives throughout Europe. So we should talk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.